Let us pray. A God in heaven, we bless your name for all that we have learned today already. We praise your name for the way you've been blessing us already. Father, we pray that as we look into your word now, you will bless us, enlighten us. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to see what we may be forgetting. And Father, we pray as we look into the scripture passages that the Holy Spirit himself will open everything up to us, interpret and apply, that we may have the best out of your word in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that we'll become better Christians, better children of God, that our lives will be more pleasing unto you in all areas, so that your grace will touch every part of us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. From 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We're taking the title of the message today. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, partakers of the divine nature. That is what we're looking at today, how we can be partakers of the divine nature. So the title is Partakers of the Divine Nature. The two verses join together here, that is verses 3 and 4. Open up to the great purpose of God's plan of redemption. And God will not be fully satisfied with a mere escape from hell or from with a mere escape from the punishment of our sins. Rather, he wants us to be partakers of the divine nature. Look at these two verses and allow the Spirit of God to impress the meaning, the interpretation and the application in your own heart. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. These two verses reveal the very mind of God and the very purpose for which Christ came. Peter the Apostle had already introduced this epistle by telling us that we are partakers of the precious faith. We have obtained like precious faith. He has spoken about the justice of God or the righteousness of God. He has spoken about Christ in verse 1 being our Savior. And his prayer is that grace and peace will be multiplied unto every listener, unto every reader as well, through the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he talks about the divine power in verse 3. And he talks about the divine gift. And that God has given us the gift of life, the gift of godliness, and also that through the knowledge we have of Christ, will be able to get into his glory and virtue. Then in verse 4, he talks about promises, the promises of God, precious promises, great promises, exceeding great and precious promises. All this heading to a particular realization that we, by the knowledge of the word of God and by the grace of God, will be able to escape the corruption that is in the world through the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes, the desires of the eyes. Now, it tells us that everything will come to a climax 
when we become partakers of the divine nature. It is very clear to see then that our escape from hell is not the primary purpose or the final purpose or the climax of our call out of the world into the grace of God. And it is not just that we'll be able to have temporal blessings upon our lives. The purpose of God actually go beyond any of those things that we might have possessed as a result of coming to the Lord. What I mean is, when we become Christians, we escape punishment. But that's not the climax, and that's not the finality of what God intended when He made Jesus Christ to go to the cross and die for us. It's wonderful we're escaping the punishment of our sins, but there's much more. The purpose of God is not just that we have bestowal of temporal blessings, which do not go beyond this world. That's wonderful. That we could have temporal blessings. Blessings of healing, blessings of deliverance, and other kinds of blessings we have in the Christian fold as we come into the kingdom of God. That is great. That is wonderful. When we become born again, we even escape the sin, the corruption, the evil that is in the world. That is wonderful that we could be forgiven, we could be cleansed, and all these evil things will add upon our lives, everything could be washed off, blotted away by the blood of the Lamb, yet there is more. He wants us to have the divine nature, so that every one of us will have that nature of Christ imparted unto us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 10, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Here you can see again the purpose of God in his dealings with us. Talk about the new birth. It's adding on to the fact that eventually, God wants us to be partakers of His holiness. Talk about the experience of sanctification. It's setting to the point where we'll become partakers of God's holiness, His nature of holiness. And talk about His dealings with us. His chastisement, His rebuke, His correction, His blessings, everything heads up to the fact that He wants us to be partakers of the divine nature of his holiness and you need to begin to look at your own life since you came to the lord is that purpose being realized in your life are you becoming partakers of that divine nature are you not being conformed more and more to the image of christ the image of god in romans chapter 8 verse 29 romans chapter 8 Verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Here again it's revealed that God's desire and God's purpose is that we become conformed to the image of his Son. I'm sure you know this, that the image of the Son or the image of the Father, they are like. Because the Son, Jesus Christ, is completely like the Father. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Therefore, everything you want to know about the Father, you know through Christ, the Lord Jesus. And therefore, we know here that when we become conformed totally to the image of the Son of God, then we are partakers already of that divine nature in first peter chapter 1 verse 16 because it is written be ye holy for i am holy you can see that nothing less than the image of god image of christ the nature of god himself nothing less than that will satisfy the heart of our father god in heaven he wants you and i to be like him 
are to be partakers of his divine nature. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. When we have the divine nature, that will be fulfilled. God doesn't want imperfection in your life or mine. Any kind of impurity in your life or mine. He doesn't want any kind of the corrupt nature of men in you or in me. He doesn't want us to have anything less than what he has. Be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To fulfill this purpose, God has given great promises. Promises that are equal to the task. He has pledged his great power to bring it to pass. And if we really and truly cooperate with him, this great purpose of redemption will be achieved. Let's look at the message point by point. Number one is God's plan. Number two, God's power. Number three, man's part. The part we have to play before these things will be realized. Number one, God's plan. Let's go back to Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust god has a plan and then he backs up that plan with his great unlimited power according as his divine power he has given unto us all things he has left nothing undone that ought to be done he's done everything necessary that you and i will be able to have all things pertaining to life pertaining to godliness so that through the knowledge of christ will be called into glory and into virtue there will be no sin in our lives on our tongue in our nature in our disposition in our attitude there will be no sin whatever within or without will be so cleansed will be so purified will be so changed will be so transformed that everything within and without will be pure that when God looks at us, looks at us on in our relationship with Him, relationship with one another, in our thoughts, in our imagination, in our disposition, in our attitude, in everything within, everything without, He will see life eternal, the heavenly life, the spiritual life, and He will see real godliness in its great beauty. When you really know Christ, and when the plan of God is fulfilled in your life, this is what you will receive. This is what you will have. Then it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Let's stop there for a moment. There are many people that are trying to get promises in Scripture. But then the promises are not leading on to how they can become partakers of the divine nature. The promises are leading on to having some temporal blessing. Some things they enjoy in this life and never will get them to heaven. Some things they can claim, they can stand upon and receive while they are here. But then the sin never really touches their nature. The sin never really touches their life. The sin never really changes or transforms them. But the purpose of the Lord, the plan of God, is that 
you will be able to become partakers of the divine nature. Then you will escape the corruption that is in the world. Think about it. Think about it. When you look at the world, any part of the world, you will see corruption. And in, in many professions in this world, if you look at the professions that people have, you see the evil, you see the sin, you see the corruption, and God is saying his desire and his plan is that you will escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Look at your community. You look at the lives of the neighbor of your neighbors, and you will see a lot of corruption. The way they speak, the way they dress, the way they relate, the idols they worship, a lot of things that are done, you will see corruption. You will see evil. You will see the death of the corruption of the nature of man. God says his plan and purpose is for you to escape all that. Look at your place of work. You will see the way people talk, the things people do, the places people go, and the things that they practice in that place of work, in that profession in particular, whatever profession. Not only the police force, not only the customs, not only the office workers, not only the market people, whatever profession you can think about, where you are, see the corruption of the nature of man that comes out so very clearly there. Well, the purpose of God is that in that place where you are, you will escape, you will escape the corruption that is in that place through loss. And see your life in the village. When you go to the village, anytime you have opportunity of going to the village, look at the corruption there. Look at the power of darkness there. Look at all the evil things, all the evil practices that are done there. You know the purpose of God is that wherever you are, in this world below, you will escape the corruption that is in the world, in any part of the world where you are. Look at, you know, our friends discourse. Sometimes the things they plan, how they plan to make others fall, how they plan to retaliate, how they plan to destroy, how they plan to bring other people down. How they will go about secretly, methodically, in a carnal way. How they just want to make other people to be defeated in life. That's part of the corruption we're talking about. The purpose of God is that as you go through this life, not a stain of the corruption of this world will attach itself unto you. God wants you to be so pure, to be so clean, and to be so transformed in your life that the corruption that comes out of the hearts of the descendants of adam will not be upon your life at all look at families if you look at families and you see the things that are said the things that are done the things that are discussed between husband and wife between relatives together in the extended family you'll see the corruption we're talking about the death the height of corruption that you never can when it comes to the open you'll be surprised let me say it this way if it were possible that as you go on in one day all the streets at the bus stop in a place of work if it were possible for the heart of man to be opened up for you to see and you will see the death of corruption in the heart in the thought in the imagination in the plan of man just see it for a moment only for one day see all the corruption in the hearts and lives of men for one day, you will know what we're talking about. It's so deep. And it's so shocking. And it's so terrible. Now, God wants you to escape all those evil things. That is the plan of God. That you will be able to escape the corruption that is in the world through loss. But that's not the end. Even after you have escaped all that, His plan is that He will impart unto you the divine nature. He will impart unto you the divine nature. Some people have so much of the nature of Satan. And they talk like the devil. And they act like the devil. What God wants to do is to remove that nature of Satan. What God wants to do is to destroy completely that body of sin and replace it with the divine nature. Some people have, so to say, the nature of animals. You see them aggressive destructive, argumentative. 
you see them as they bounce on other people, almost want to tear other people to pieces, you will understand that some people have the nature of the beast. What God wants to do is to get into the life of every one of us and reach out his mighty powerful hand, take out that nature of the beast and replace the nature with the nature of himself, the divine nature. As you look at some people who are worldly wise, worldly wise, very, very carnal, very cunning, very clever, and uh, they, they, they've learned all about psychology and philosophy, and they can use psychology on their wives. They can use philosophy on their children. They can use psychology and philosophy together on even their friends. And they try to get their way through life. Where, you know, they use a lot of politics, a lot of things. And it's the corruption of the world. It is the nature of the people of the world. It is the nature of man. That, you know, some people, they can take all your property away and they'll be smiling to you. They can destroy your name, destroy your person, and they'll be, you know, they'll be smiling at you. They, they would appear that they love you. That's the cunning, craftiness, cleverness of man. You know, what God wants to do is to take that nature of carnal man out of your life and then to replace that evil nature with the divine nature and just change you entirely. This is the purpose of God. This is the plan of God. But look at this. In the past, in the present, in the future, this purpose or plan remains the same. What was God's plan when he created man? That takes us to the... Uh, to the very beginning. That takes us to the past. The plan of God is that its nature will be in the heart, in the life of every man. Look at it. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let's stop there for a moment. The past purpose of God plan of God is that he will make man just like himself after his own likeness and that purpose still remains firm today if you are any different in your nature in your lifestyle in your behavior in your conduct in your attitude in your delight in your likes in, in what you want if you are any different from God you have not achieved or the purpose of God has not been achieved in your life. In your life. You must hate sin the way God hates sin. Love righteousness the way God loves righteousness. You must be pure. You must be holy. The way Christ has shown us in his innocent, perfect, holy, sinless life. How he was pure. That is the very purpose of God for you. Let's look at it today. Are you there? Have you achieved that? As a grace of God works so much in your life that you are completely like Christ after his likeness in his image as the blood of Christ so cleansed you so purified you so purged you so transformed you that you are completely like the Lord Jesus Christ well that is exactly what God had in mind when he created man he didn't want to create man in the image of an angel after the likeness of an angel Sometimes you hear us say that we are not angels. No, we are not. And the purpose of God is not even to make us like angels. You know, the purpose of God, he wanted us to, just to be like him. Not like an angel, still higher. Still higher. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And isn't that what he did? Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them i know there are some commentators or some interpreters that will say that means god created every man to have two hands two feet two eyes a mouth to speak out and a good brain that's all that it means that God created man in his own image. I'm sure you know that that kind of interpretation falls short of the fullness of revelation we have in Scripture. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 
chapter 4, verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God, you see that, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. As we talk about being created in the image of God, here is it, created in righteousness, created in true holiness, created in purity, created in real life that is without sin, a life that is above reproach, a life that is above sin, doesn't have any sin, any stain, whatever. That's the purpose of God. That was his purpose in the past. You see, God's purpose in your life and my life will only be realized when at heart I'm holy, completely holy, completely pure, completely transformed. And I'm in the image, and you are in the image of God. I mean, when you come to that point, that you are in the image of God, I'm in the image of God, that is what God is desiring. And that is what God is working at. I told you that was purpose. What is the present purpose now? Has it changed? Doesn't he want us to still be of that image right now? Let us see again. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Let's see the plan today. The purpose today. Its intention today. Its delight today. Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Ye might be partakers of the divine nature. That's the present purpose of God. You know that? That's the delight of God right now. You know that? That we might be partakers of the divine nature. Before I continue, let's address some questions. Let me ask you, and you can ask me if you have opportunity. What do we know about the divine nature? What do we know that the divine nature will not do? That God will not do? Well, we know a number of things that God will not do. Number one, God will not lie. We're sure of that. God will not deceive. We're sure of that. If I have the divine nature, you have the divine nature, you will not lie. In any form, in any form. There are people that lie with action. There are even people that lie with silence. There are people that can lie with the facial appearance. There are people that can lie in various, various ways. When we have the divine nature, we will not lie in any form. You will not lie in the words of your mouth, in the actions that you put forth, in your attitude, by silence. You will not lie in any way to anyone for any reason on earth. God will never lie for any reason to anyone. He will never deceive. He will not call it diplomacy. That's what people say. When they lie, they say it's diplomacy. He will not call it wisdom. God will not call a lie wisdom. That's what people do. God will not lie. When you have the divine nature, you are not going to lie for any reason to anyone. Not only that, we know that the divine nature will not abhor, will not accept, will not entertain evil thoughts. Evil thought towards your husband, towards your wife, suspicion, not God. Not, the divine nature will not allow that. The divine nature will not abhor or entertain evil thoughts. Will the divine nature be able to go out and commit adultery and cover it up? The divine nature will it commit fornication? Will the divine nature be able to enjoy bad pictures and look at those bad pictures and delight in them and inflame the body with the lust of the flesh by looking at all those evil pictures? Divine nature will not enjoy that. Will divine nature kill? Will divine nature murder? Will the divine nature commit abortion? Will the divine nature uh, deal cruelly with another fellow? Will the divine nature steal? Will the divine nature be covetous? Will the divine nature be wicked? Be deceitful? Will the divine nature be proud? 
with the divine nature. Go out and just get drunk and smoke all these things they are smoking and then uh, say that they are enjoying life. No, divine nature will not do that. You know the purpose of God? He wants you and I to have the divine nature. Divine nature. You see, when we have the divine nature, all those outward sins we've been talking about, everything will be gotten rid of. There will be no sin at all in your life. You will be free from sin. You see, many people are not thinking of that. That is why we find many people who say that they know God, and yet they are full of unrighteousness. There are people that will profess they know God, they go to church, they read the Bible. You check up in their lives, once in a while you find fornication and adultery is coming again. Once in a while you find wickedness. Once in a while you find fighting. Once in a while you begin to find, find in their lives that there is so much of covetousness. Running after the things of the world. They run after money. As if money is everything to them. It has become a God in their lives. And there are people, you know, they have so much of maliciousness. And they can malign other people, destroy other people, slander other people. That is in the divine nature. Let me tell you something, my friends here today. If you die, listen to me. If you die without possessing the divine nature, it will be a sorry matter. It will be a terrible thing. Because no one is going to get to heaven without the fullness of the divine nature. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. God and all the people that have his nature, all the people that have his life, his godliness, those are the people that are going to be in heaven at last. But if we're full of envy, if we debate the word of God, if we deceive one another, if we slander one another, if we backbite against one another, divine nature will not hurt another fellow. Divine nature will not lie against another fellow. Divine nature will not bear false witness against your fellow brother. The divine nature will not backbite. The divine nature will not go about as, uh, as tail bearers. The divine nature will not hate God or hate the people of God or hate the things of God. The divine nature will not be proud, will not be boastful. The divine nature will not be disobedient to the word of God. The divine nature will not uh, be covenant breakers, kick out the wife, marry another one, and be living a rough life, a licentious life, a reckless life. We're talking about the desire of God. And this is the plan of God. He wants you and I. He wants you and I to possess the divine nature. And when we possess the divine nature, outwardly our lives will change. I'm telling you. Outwardly our lives will change. When we have the divine nature, that divine nature will just make us free from fornication, idol worship, adultery, being effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. The divine nature will make us to be free from stealing, will make us to be free from covetousness, will make us to be free from this pride of life that makes us to belittle other people and think that we are the all in all. The divine nature will make us to honor and respect one another. Uh, you look at your fellow brothers and your fellow sisters, you'll be praising God for them. You'll be praising God for the privileges and the opportunities they, they have. Because, you know, you have the nature of Christ. You become meek, you become gentle, you become kind, you become good. Good by the grace of God, that ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. Let's look at Romans again, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Brothers and sisters, Calvary is not a joke. If Calvary couldn't do anything more than what human beings on their own can do, then Calvary will be a joke. It would not have been necessary for Jesus Christ to go to the cross of Calvary and die. If all that Calvary will produce is what some people can produce on their own. Now listen. I know people who are not Christians. I know people who don't know the Lord, who are honest. And if we who say that we have tasted the grace of God coming from Calvary, if we are not honest, what has Calvary done? 
I know people who will not give bribe, who will not take bribe. They may not be many, but I know them. A few people. They are not born again. If Calvary cannot produce in us hatred for bribe, hatred for corruption, that the people who don't know about Calvary, what they have, we cannot get to their stage, then well, how about it? If Calvary cannot do something in you, do something in me, that will make me to go beyond the people that have not tasted Christ, what has Christ done? What then will be the meaning of the cross of Calvary? I know some women in the world that they are not interested in all these flamboyant things of the world. I know some women, they are not even born again. They don't even know Christ. All that they have is, they just have, you know, some kind of conduct and character. And they say that they want their lives to do something for their children, do something for their family, and do something for their neighbors. And therefore they are not concerned with all these uh, flamboyant things of the world. If Calvary cannot produce a hatred for worldliness in you and in me, more than these people of the world, what has Calvary done? Look at this. The purpose of God is that Calvary will do something. The cleansing of the blood of Jesus will do something until we are conformed to the image of the Son of God. Look, this verse 29 uses strong, strong, strong word. Look at it again. For whom he did foreknow, the foreknowledge of God. You see, that's a very strong word. It means that this thing we're talking about, being conformed to the image of Christ, is not something of, of the moment. It is of the foreknowledge of God. It's from centuries past. It's from time immemorial that God had this foreknowledge. And then it says, He also did predestinate. Uh, you know what that means? That He actually determined. And He actually predestinated. And he said that the people that will come into the kingdom of God, the predestination that God knows about is not the predestination that some will be saved and some will not be saved. The predestination that God knows about is that all those who are saved, all those who are born again, all those who come into the kingdom of God, they are predestined to become like Jesus Christ, to be conformed to the image of his son. You talk about predestination, that is it. That is it, that the purpose of God, the plan of God, what God has affirmed before the angels from all eternity is that Christ will die and that Christ will raise up children unto him and that he has so determined, he has so predestinated that all those that come into the kingdom of God, if they are real children of God, they will be conformed to the image of his dear son. If you don't even have any interest, in holiness, in righteousness, in being free from sin, in living a pure life, in becoming so pure, so holy, so changed, so transformed, that to become conformed to the image of Christ, it will be very difficult to believe that God had any foreknowledge about you. Think about it. Think about it. That is a strong language of this verse. That whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you have an in, in interest to be holy? Interest to be righteous? Do you ever pray about it? Do you ever desire it? Are you ever hungering after it? Thirsting after it? Are you knocking at the gate of God every time saying, Oh God, fulfill it in me. Oh God, fulfill it in me. Oh God, do it in me. I want to be conformed, to be conformed to the image of his son. Let me tell you something. When we are conformed to the image of a son, we'll never be angry at home or outside, in the bus or on the road, with the workers, with anyone. Our facial appearance will never look angry. Our words will never speak of anger. Our heart will never pump out any angry, any angry blood. We'll never be so aggressive as to be angry and people will see if they see anger in you if they see anger in me that's it we are not conformed yet we are not conformed yet we are not conformed yet to the image of a son and there's the purpose of god this is a plan of god that you and i become conformed to the image of a son and so the lord is waiting on us he says when are we going to pray when are we going to call upon him 
so that we'll be totally conformed, totally conformed to the image of his dear son. Now, I said in the past, that has been God's plan. In the present, I've just shown it to you now. This has been God's plan. How about in the future? Will God change in the future and say, well, since not many people understand being conformed to the image of Christ, being partakers of the divine nature, let me change. Let me allow. Let me accept the lower standard. No, in the future, it is still going to be the same. Anyone that is going to be with God, anyone that is going to inherit that world to come, he must still have this conformity to the image of the dear son. Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Can you see into the future? We shall be like him. In the past, God wanted us to be like him. He made man in his own image. In the present, he has predestined that all those who come into the kingdom of God must, must be conformed unto the image of Jesus Christ. In the future, he wants us to be like him, that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I want you to look away from other people. Look away from other people. If possible, look away from all friends, all neighbors. Look away from all people that touch your life. Maybe you have been seen. So and so is uh, proud. Therefore, I can be proud. No, not at all. No, not at all. Other people in purity, other people in piety, other people's sins is not an excuse for you or for me. People can hurt me. People can push me. People can knock me. That is not an excuse for me to become anything less than Jesus Christ. Anything less than, than possessing the image, the divine nature of the Lord in my life. The same thing with you. People can cheat you. People can push you. People can knock you. People can say anything, do anything against you. That is not an excuse on your part. Look at it. That he might present you to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. Not having spot, not having wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. You know what the consecration of your heart ought to be? Your consecration ought to be, O oh Lord, there may not be any other holy person in this community. There may not be any other righteous person in my community. But Lord, I want to have that divine image. Because that's the plan of God. Until I'm completely glorious within and without. Not having any spot. Not having any wrinkle. Or any sort of thing. Until I'm completely through and through. I am holy and without blemish. Now, can God do it? Can he give us that divine nature in reality? Or is it just reaching the Bible like this? That brings us to the next point. God's power. When I talk of God's power, I'm talking of God's power in a very serious way. I'm talking of God's power to create and recreate and transform and keep us in that position. I believe in God. I believe in the power of God. God created this world out of nothing. And when he created man, he created man out of the dust of the earth. The dust normally is dirty. The dust normally is of almost of no consequence. Out of that thing of no consequence, he created man and he made man holy. And he made man pure. He got man out of this ground and yet he made that man in his own image. I believe in that God of power that is able to create. And I believe in that God of power that is able to recreate man today. However low we have fallen. However deep we have gone into sin. However wrong our nature might be. However much of the nature of Satan we might have got. However distorted, rough we might appear to be. I believe in a God that has power. That is able to take mortal man. 
sinful man and change him through and through and change him all over with his mighty power that means that god can get hold of you he can forgive your sin he can wash you clean and he can change you within and change you without until there is no spot there is no wrinkle there is no blemish until you are holy completely he has the power with him all things are possible let's go back to second peter chapter one second peter chapter one verse three according as his divine power according as his divine power the holiness we're talking about is not the holiness you can have in your power it's not the holiness you can have in your own strength. It's not the holiness you can have in your own determination. It's not the holiness you can practice by keeping quiet, walking gently, not looking at the face of women, not stepping on an And We're talking about something supernatural. We're talking about something that God himself, the mighty hand of God, will do in your life. We're talking about something that only Calvary, only the cross of Christ, only the blood of Jesus Christ can accomplish. We're talking about something that only the power of God can bring it about according as his divine power. As given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, that by these, by the power and the promises together ye might be partakers of the divine nature Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws, he has the power, he can do it. Haven't you heard? Look at it in Psalm 62, verse 11. Psalm 62, verse 11. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this that power belongeth unto God. Oh, yes, power belongeth unto God. The power that is able to create and recreate. The power that is able to change and transform. The power that is able to get into your life and get rid of that nature of Satan. That cunning craftiness. That deceitfulness. And that very evil, the nature of Adam. The power that is able to get into the heart of man. Uproot. Uproot. Take everything away. You know, it amazes you. That human beings can create a bulldozer that can uproot a mighty tree and take it away from that place that you and take it to such a place you never see it again. If man can do that, don't you know God can make a spiritual, high power, highly supernatural bulldozer that he can come into your life and just uproot that thing? He has the power, he has the power. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. Doesn't it surprise you that human beings can create a kind of bomb that when they throw it at a particular building, a particular building that is, uh, you know, that has a very strong foundation, he can shift that building, just remove it and throw it all away at a moment of time. What do you think of God? Power belonging unto God. The power of God can so come into your life that he will uproot, he will destroy. He will take away the nature of Satan, the nature of sin, and the nature of Adam, and the nature of, of the carnal man, and he will replace that nature with his divine nature. He can do it because with him all things are possible. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. And I'm looking at verse 17. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Our Lord God... Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretch out arm, and there is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing too hard for thee. When we talk of there is nothing too hard of thee, some people think about other little, little things that God, they want God to do. We are talking about something of the divine nature. It is not hard for God to take the nature of sin away from you and implant its nature in you, a nature that will not sin, a nature that will not enjoy sin, a nature that will not delight in sin, a nature that 24 hours of the day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, in the night, there will be no sin. First day, second day, until the seventh day of the week, there will be no sin. That you can spend a whole week and say, praise the Lord by the power of the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, this week has been a pure week, a holy week. 
This week has been a week of victory. Victory over sin. Victory over everything that is evil. The power of God can do that. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. For with God. That's it. For with God. Nothing shall be impossible. Doubters may doubt, I believe. Sinners may say, how can God do it? I cannot say, how can God? I know God can do it. God can do it. Unbelievers are asking, can God? I turn it around, I say God can. God can. God can do all things. He created the heavens and the earth. He made man originally in his own image. He can do all things. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. He can change your nature. He can change your life. He can turn you around. He can make you so pure, so holy, that the image of Christ will be reproduced in you once again. Look at that same Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75. That he will grant unto us that we have been delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. That's what I told you before. That God can make us holy every day of the week. Every week of the year. Not by your own strength. Not by your own power. But by the spirit of the Lord. By the grace of God. He can bring this transformation. He can do it. That you will live without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him. All the days of your life. After he has done it. Can he keep us? Can it keep us from falling back into sin? Going back into evil? Well, the Bible says it can. It can. And it will do it if you believe. In Jude verse 24. Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless, blameless, sinless, pure and holy. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He is able to keep you from falling. So you don't fall into adultery anymore. You don't fall into fornication anymore. You don't fall into deceit and lying anymore. You don't fall into covetousness anymore. You don't fall into pride anymore. You don't fall into secret evil thought anymore. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. You don't fall into bribery and corruption anymore. You don't fall into the weakness of the flesh anymore. You don't fall into the worldliness in the world anymore. He is able to keep you from falling. You don't fall into that anger, that uh, evil talk, that backbiting anymore. You don't fall into that inordinate desire coming out from the heart anymore unto him. That is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, blameless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He can do it. But we have a part to play. That brings us to point three. What's our part? Well, we have to pray. We have to pray. We have to seek the face of the Lord. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Chapter 33, verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knewest not. Call unto me, and I don't know any other mighty thing you want. I don't know anything mightier than this. To have the image of God. To have that superimposed, imparted into our nature. On our heart. That's the greatest thing, the mightiest thing you can ever have. Some people are asking for little, little things. They think that is mighty. They are asking for, how can I have this little thing, that little thing, that material thing. They think that is a mighty thing. But you ask for the divine nature. The divine nature. The divine nature. The divine nature that comes into you and you will never be the same again. And the, the image of Christ and the conformity to Christ is reproduced in you. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. You've never known what it means to possess the divine nature, which thou knowest not. You've never known what it feels like never to get angry, never to get angry in your heart towards anyone, towards your children, towards your wife, towards your husband, towards your neighbors, towards your subordinates in the place of work, never to get angry. Maybe you've never known what that means. 
You've never known what it means to be free from covetousness, free from pride, free from worldliness. Never know what it means to have the heart pure, the heart holy, the nature holy, the divine image within you. You've never known what it means to be perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You've never known what it means to be holy within and without through and through in the depth of your nature you've never known what it means to have christ the mind of christ the fullness of the mind of christ completely in you it says i will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not and if you will ask if you will pray if you will tell god oh god i want it oh god i want it then the lord says he will do it jeremiah chapter 29 jeremiah chapter 29 in verse 13 and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart when you ask the lord when you are not missing words you are not saying oh god give me this little thing and this little thing and also give me the divine nature when you concentrate all your prayer when you concentrate all your desire when you concentrate all your plan when you concentrate all the all the ambition within you when you concentrate every kind of motion every kind of desire from within you on possessing the divine nature when you are walking around and you say lord as you are walking on the road what i need is the divine nature when you are having your quiet time, what I need is the divine nature. When you are praying in the church, what I need is the divine nature. When you are in your office and people like to provoke you, you say, Lord, grant me the divine nature. When people are doing things that will annoy you, you say, Lord, give me the divine nature. And when people are praying, they are praying for children, others are praying for healing, you say, Lord, what I want from the depths of my heart. I want the divine nature. When you pray like that, when you pray like that, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart when other people are looking for position other people are looking for privilege other people are trying to converse their way through other people are using politics other people say i need another car i need money i need this and you say oh lord the burden of my heart is that i want the divine nature i want the divine nature when you seek the lord like that then you will find him when you search for him with all your heart the chance is there today. Why don't you just fall on your knees? Why don't you just fall on your knees and say, Lord, I want the divine nature. It's taken a long time that I came to the church. It's taken a long time that I came to the kingdom of God. And yet, I'm so far away from the divine nature. Why don't you fall on your knees now and fall on your faces now and just say, Lord, divine nature. Lord, divine nature. Lord, divine nature. And let, let your heart cry out. Let your heart just go out before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I want until my heart is pure, until my nature is pure, until there is no sin, there is no evil, my thoughts are pure, my ambition clean, my desires clean, everything within, everything without will show of the beauty of holiness, of the glory of God, until there is no wrinkle, there is no spot, there is no blemish, everything is completely holy. I want you to just call upon the Lord while you're on your knees. While you're on your knees, don't sit on the bench, please. This is a serious matter. You must be partakers of the divine nature. It's when you pray fervently. It's when you pray with all your heart. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth more. It's when you're importunate about it. It's when you knock at the gate of heaven and you knock and knock and knock and knock again. It is when you call upon the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you say, Lord, take away anything that is contrary out of my heart, out of my nature. Get on your knees. Get on your knees. Get on your knees. And talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want that divine nature. I want that divine nature. I will not let you go except you give it to me. I will not leave you except you give it to me. Grant me the faith that will be able to claim this blessing. Grant me the faith that will be able to get it. Until, Lord, anywhere, everywhere I am, I'm pure within and without. Until I'm ready for the rapture. I'm ready for the coming of God. Until I can say, come, Lord Jesus, and the very life of heaven is being lived on earth here. From morning till evening, I live a righteous, pure, holy life. No grudge against anybody, and no lying against anybody, and no covetousness, nothing, whatever. Everything, the life of God, the very nature of God and the image of christ comes right into you fall on your faces and call upon the name of the lord you have to pray you have to pray you have to pray christ has done it on the cross of calvary 
and the purpose of God, the plan of God, and he has backed it up with his part to you, is that you will have, you will have the very nature of God implanted into you. Pray until it is done. Pray until it is done. You see how Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. You see how he sweated blood. You see how he cried with strong tears and he called upon the Father. Can't you pray like that? Can't you pray like that? Can't you talk unto the Lord and say, oh Lord, I need it. And brush everything aside. Forget everything you've been asking before and say, Lord, this is my desire. This is my goal. This is what I'm looking for. Do it for me. The Lord will definitely answer until you are pure and holy, without sin, without reproach, through and through. To me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. <laughs> I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just thank God for all his provisions. I just bless you with the